one of the disputes that surfaced was that Rupert Murdoch's lawyer said, you nailed it. You did great during your deposition. And he said, I don't think the other side feels that way. <laughs> so the beauty of a third party is that it's easier for the third party mediator to say, I don't know, Rupert might not want to testify. In this particular case, according to the media reports, the judge was imploring, that's the word I've seen in the media reports, the judge was imploring them to settle. That in and of itself, whatever that means, puts a different spin on, well, we haven't gotten there, we need help, right? We're, we're right at the door, we're on the courtroom steps. The only good idea is to let me and John do our job and mediate this thing right here. You want to hear the crazy thing? I know it doesn't feel like it, but we're making progress. Mm -hmm. Settle! Settle, 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 settle! I don't want to settle. All we're trying to say is put your swords away for a second. Let's finish this and let's move on. Welcome to Mediator in the Middle. This is your place to peek behind the curtain of what a mediator is really thinking. I'm your host, Abe Melamed, a litigator turned mediator. In this series, I, along with world-renowned mediators, will offer you, the clients, the lawyers, the parties to mediations, tips and tricks on how to be more effective in mediation and ultimately get yourself the best result possible. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy. Welcome back to Mediator in the Middle, a podcast about mediation by mediators for lawyers, litigators, their clients. I'm your host, Abe Melamed, and... I'm joined today by two excellent guests, one of which many of our listeners have already had a chance to meet, which is Ruth Raisfeld. Ruth is a really well-known mediator, particularly in the East Coast in the New York region. She does a lot of employment, some commercial, just a very experienced mediator. And the other great guest we have today is Kyle Beth Hilfer, who is a really renowned arbitrator and mediator, and in particular has expertise in the advertising and IP space. So has some interesting subject matter knowledge on our topic for today. And the topic for today is talking a little bit about the Dominion versus Fox settlement that is all over the media right now. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the mediator who played a significant role in resolution. I will start out just by offering the disclaimer that I'm not an expert. I don't think I, I'll let Ruth and Kyle Beth speak for themselves on this, but I don't think any of us purport to be experts or to have any intimate knowledge of what went on here beyond what's been reported publicly. But what is a little bit unique about this is that so much of this has been reported publicly. And so we'll offer some insights and opinions about what we see on the on the face of the reports, but nothing really beyond that. So let me start with Ruth. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Of course. Any, anything I missed about your background or about that disclaimer you want to add? Well, the disclaimer is that obviously uh, we were not involved in any way, shape or form. And all of our comments are just based on what we've read and our knowledge. I've been an attorney for 42 years. And when I started to pay attention, when the case was about to start and it settled, to me, it just screamed out all of these characteristics of cases that settled. Most cases, 99.9% .9 of cases, civil cases, do settle. I don't know if it's exactly 99.9, .9, but the experience of most lawyers is that the vast majority of cases settle, and the, and the question is why. And I thought that the Dominion versus Fox case had so many typical characteristics of um, factors that lead to settlement that it, it begs us to talk about it to help educate uh, not only attorneys who are trying to settle cases and don't really think about the settlement process as much as we mediators do, um, that I appreciate the opportunity to discuss it with you and Kyle Bet. We appreciate that. And I, I'd say it's a shame you didn't take out a bet in Vegas on the settling when you uh, when you realized it was likely to. I'm not a gambler. <laughs> Not a gambler. Fair enough. Well, we appreciate that. We're really happy to have you here. And Kyle Beth, also your you know great expert in this field and in mediation in general and settlement in general. So anything I missed about your background or about the prefatory piece of this that you want to mention? No, just, just echoing Ruth's comments that this is all 
anything we have to say here is based on what we've read. We have no inside knowledge. And my, my lens is also comes from an arbitration perspective as well, because I'm an active arbitrator and following what I did follow about this case, it, it screamed out for settlement. I'm not surprised it settled. I mean, maybe the, the timing of the settlement, you know, kind of took everyone a little by surprise, but based on how this case was progressing and the very public nature of the disclosures that were being made, it's not a surprise that it settled. Yeah. And I think that the amount surprised me too. <laughs> um, I think it's the largest settlement for a defamation type claim, but I think that's a great point from both of you that this is this is a case we all, I think, could have predicted as mediators needed to settle, should have settled. And I think it's nice to see it did and that there's some publicity about the process because we're big advocates for that. One of the most unique pieces of this from my view, and I litigated for a long time before I transitioned to mediation, but I'm well aware of the confidentiality aspects that usually come with resolution. It's a term that's always asked for by usually the paying party. It's something that a lot of states have taken measures to try to get around to try to outlaw, which frankly has become an issue with the lawyers because the lawyers want to get deals done. And so you very rarely get to see a window into the settlement, certainly to even find out how much it settled for is unique. And I think one of the unique things here is that there were obligations to disclose to shareholders. And so there is the 8K filing that lays out a little bit, and maybe we'll reference that a little later and talk through the, the language in it, but references the $787.5 million settlement. So the confidentiality not being here and the ability to talk about this openly, I think is unique and maybe unique opportunity for us to shed some light on what the mediation process is through the lens of this case. What do you see is unique about that confidentiality aspect? What would you maybe want to say based on what you've seen reported publicly about this case? Yeah, so a very unique uh, format for this whole mediation. So the, the, the media has reported that the mediator gets a phone call while he's on a river cruise outside Bucharest. I think he's on Ama Waterways. And those river cruises are tiny. And he gets a, a call at the last minute, really. I think it was maybe Sunday, the day before the case is going to go to trial and says, would you serve as a mediator in this? In any event, you know, he gets this call and all of a sudden he's plunged into this case. And I think we've, we've all had situations where we get last minute phone calls. I mean, mediators, that's the nature of our business is that when, when, when duty calls, we go, people are asking for our help and we want to help, right? Um, what makes his setting a little more unique is that he's on vacation in a very confined space and he said publicly in news reports that he did this mediation, a combination from being on the river cruise itself to also being on a tour bus. And he said he had to put his kind of put his coat over the phone. He was apparently in the back of the bus and trying to preserve confidentiality. You know, that's an unusual thing, right? I mean, I don't think many of us have found ourselves mediating in public. Um, but that's a very unique part of this. And I think the case is so much in the media spotlight that I would imagine he made disclosures to the parties about where he was and the nature of what he was doing and probably got permission to tell the press afterwards about his process. And that I think that's a fundamental tenet of the mediation process is the parties believing and, and knowing that it's going to remain confidential. Here you have this unique element because the number at least was going to be public and all that. So, uh, you know, Jerry Roscoe is a very experienced and respected mediator. I'm sure he took every measure necessary and, and probably disclosed, like you said, and got permission to discuss these things. But I think that's a wonderful point that in, in the usual mediation, we may get called in last minute, but it's rare that we're going to have to do it in this kind of a fashion. So I think it's important to, the, the basic understanding of mediation is that the negotiations will be confidential. Anything said or heard during the mediation process is confidential, especially when they're on the verge of going, of speaking in court, literally. Right. Uh, if you look at what the mediator has said, he, he's being pressed who, who, which side was more resolute, you know, 
what would, he he has not said, and I'm sure he will not say uh, anything about what was said during the mediation by the negotiating parties. Right. He's talked a little bit about where he was, what he was doing. That's just part of the drama. And the settlement itself is obviously not confidential, but but it's important to um, distinguish between the, this, the confidentiality of the communications during negotiations and the result. The reason that this is unusual is that um, most disputes are not as fought out in the press from beginning to end. You, we, right. There have been um, mediations and arbitrations involving celebrity uh, contracts, for example, basketball players, you know, who get an arbitration decision, whereas when an arbitrator issues a ruling, the parties have to authorize that to be public. Here, there must have been a, an understanding that this was going to be reported in open court and the public was going to know. And as you've said, as public company, they had to make this disclosure. But generally speaking, the calling card of mediation is that the negotiations will be confidential. And so far, that that's all that he said. He has not right. taken the bait. He said both parties wanted to settle. Yeah. Which we, is... also, we don't know what else was in that settlement. And we also don't right. know what else might have come out. One of the, It's not just the negotiations that are confidential, but any, any evidence that Okay, I mean, yeah. plenty of evidence came out in this case, right? But what else might have come? We we don't know, and we won't, and we won't know. And he's not gonna he's not going to be revealing that. All he's talking about is the sort of dramatic fun stuff, right? The confidentiality is such a critical term. You know, it's really interesting. I've been contacted several times by advocacy groups. I've even dealt with Congress on occasion about what information can you provide to us about cases you've dealt with? We're working on, you know, the fair chance we're working on, um, you know, abolishing mandatory arbitration. We want stories to present to Congress about ways in which people were silenced. And the unfortunate reality is the response usually has to be, I can't talk about it. The parties can't talk about it. Confidentiality is critical. And so that's, I think, what's really so unique about this. And you see that sometimes with major settlements of sexual harassment claims or things like that against big networks, sometimes the dollar figure gets out there, but usually that's a factor they're, they're looking to buy essentially is the quiet. This is not going to be out in public. And that's, I think, really unique here. And, and I, I'm really excited about it. And I think that both of you probably are too, because I think it provides us an opportunity as mediators to talk a little more openly not about the facts of specific cases per se, because again, confidentiality, but about the process and the value proposition of a mediator in getting a case settled. You know, the, the articles have reported, I think it was the CNN article that the lawyers in this case, and both parties were represented clearly by very sophisticated lawyers, but that the lawyers had tried to talk settlement between themselves and were unable to bridge the gap and needed to bring in a seasoned mediator to help the process. And I think a lot of people sometimes have that question, what is the difference between negotiating between the lawyers and having a mediator involved? And so what do you see as the biggest value add here for a mediator stepping in and, and maybe in other cases that you see the value out of a mediator stepping in? Okay. So I think one of the reasons for calling in a third party is that the lawyer, the lawyers are advocates. They're zealous advocates for, for a point of view that, that, that they want to get across to win and their clients hire them to win. And it's very difficult for attorneys who have been telling the client, this is how we're going to win, that yeah. Oops, maybe you should settle. And very often with corporate clients as well as individuals, they don't wanna hear that, oh, now you're talking about risk. I thought we were gonna win. Yeah. I thought we had a good chance on appeal. I thought that we were going to devastate that client. Like one of the disputes that, that surfaced was that um, Rupert Murdoch's lawyer uh, said, you nailed it. You did great during your deposition. And he said to him, and he said, I don't think the other side feels that way. <laughs> so so the, the, the beauty of a third party is that it, it's easier for the third party mediator now in this case roscoe didn't have that much time to read the file to say i don't know rupert might not want to testify so now it's it's just it's both the lawyer and the neutral who are doing the reality testing 
and we know just from um, social science generally, you could watch Succession for this same point. <laughs> Nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news or a different point of view to the uh, main protagonist. Yeah. Very hard to tell the head honcho, uh, by the way, you might be wrong. By the way, the odds might not be what we originally said. And so a, a neutral third party who is not going to be coming in again is, is more, the more effective person, which is why Ken Feinberg was so critical to settling the um, 9-11 victims' compensation disputes. Because yeah. he, he could tell the lawyers, you're looking at this thing through rose-colored glasses, and um, maybe you should consider settlement. In this particular case, according to the media reports, the judge was imploring, that's the word I've seen in the media reports, the judge was, judge was imploring them to settle. That, that's a very strong word, right? Imploring. Yeah. Um, he wasn't urging, he wasn't suggesting, he wasn't, he wasn't demanding, he was imploring. That in and of itself, whatever that means, we can take away what we wish, puts a different spin on, well, we haven't gotten there, we need help. Right, we're we're right at the door. We're on the courtroom steps. The the, the slide deck is being loaded for, to, for yeah. opening statements. Right, so I think that combined with the fact that they knew there would be a deluge of media attention, one way or the other, with this case, I think were very much an impetus to get a mediator involved. And they almost had nothing to lose at this point by trying a mediator. Um, right. But I I think from a, a broader perspective, if you know, this, this case is very unique, but what, what lesson can we learn from it? Uh, in some ways, I mean, a couple of things that come to mind for me is if I, if I think about appellate mediation, which I do a decent amount of, um, there's already a ruling, right? So, mm -hmm. so why, why should somebody settle that, right? They've already gotten a ruling in their favor, and, but yet there's a, there's a risk of, of being overturned and there's the continuing drag on finances and business and emotions and whatever else is going on. And some of those are um, reasons to try again, to settle. Now, in those cases, they're often ordered to mediation. I don't know if the imploring it involved any, any wrangling <laughs> here as well. Um, but the, and the second point I wanted to make is that this case is, is a little bit different from most in terms of the sophistication of the parties as well as the attorneys and the sophistication and education level of the parties about the case itself. I'm sure these were highly informed clients, but in many, many cases, settlement negotiations may go on between attorneys who are zealous advocates and maybe, you know, the attorney picks up the phone and says, they offered you a million two, you wanted 10. You're, and they say, that's ridiculous. But do they pass on the details of where that 1.2 came from? Do they yeah. even know? Has that, been, has that been fleshed out as part of the lawyer, the, the lawyer should be explaining all that, but we all know it doesn't happen very often, right? So mediation gives you the one opportunity for all the parties to get equally educated beyond what their lawyers have zealously advocated for and beyond what the lawyer may have, have um, transmitted. This is, this is the one opportunity. Why mediate? Because you're gonna hear it directly from the other side. And once you're hearing it in a courtroom, you're speaking to the jury or you're speaking to the judge, you're not speaking to the other side in the same way. So this is a unique opportunity to get everybody on the same page about the other side of the case. Mm -hmm. I think our role, or at least the role I like to play is to ask all of the questions, make sure we've thought through every angle. And sometimes the lawyers haven't thought about it. It might be a unique perspective that you come up with because you're a neutral and you're, you've got fresh eyes, but many times it's the same issues that the lawyers have talked through, but like you both mentioned, and in particular, Ruth, you said earlier, their job is to advocate. Their job is to be positional. It's to say, but I think we're going to win on this issue. 
here you have a mediator that can step in and, and say, well, you know, why don't we think about this holistically? How might a jury see this issue? What do you think about this? And to say it directly to the parties, which is an interesting point that you made, Kyle, that, that it sounds like the parties may have played less of a role here and the lawyers may have played more of a role. Sometimes with really large settlements, that's more common. But I think the ability to have those conversations in front of the client, be able to say, you know, how do you think you might respond to this? I'm just concerned about this piece or whatever it might be is I think a really critical value. So, you know, I, I think that there are telltale pieces of why we all saw this case as something that should have settled. And I'm curious, what about it do you see maybe going in before you saw it settled as this should be a case that should settle? And now that it has settled and you see kind of at least a little bit of what we know publicly and what the public filings have said, that you see as a telltale reason why mediation and, and resolution may actually be feasible in, in really, like we've said, 99% of the cases? Sure. Well, I mean, there's probably a long tell list in this in this sure. case, uh, <laughs> you know, of, of things that were pointing, <laughs> that were harbingers of what was to come. I'm going to zero in on, on how things went in discovery and the judge's rulings along the yeah. way. Um, the, the, as I was watching the case, those were the two biggest, biggest tells for me in terms of the Fox perspective, right? That depositions were going poorly. All these text messages were pouring out to the public um, and they were, they were fairly damning. And then you couple that with a series of, of rulings from the judge where the judge wasn't letting them use a legal argument, the, the sort of neutral media, right, defense that the judge said, you can't use that. And then the judge said, we're going to make Rupert, allow Rupert Mur Murdoch to be subpoenaed to testify. Yeah. Um, Carlson was up next, right? You know, so the big, we know the big guys are coming and, and, and we've seen how it's gone in discovery with them. So Fox had a lot of incentive and really what is Fox, what was Fox trying to do? I mean, what are the interests, right? Fox wants to keep its audience happy. It wants to preserve its relationship with its viewers. That's its number one goal. I, 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 who am I to speak for Fox, but just uh, observationally, it seems to me. And if there's a way to settle that allows them to preserve its relationship with its viewers, now that all of these things are coming out and it's not going well, that's a huge incentive for Fox. What's on Dominion's side, it's, it's a little bit murkier, right? You know, they said they're after the truth and they wanted their business to be made whole. We don't really know too much about um, what the damage really was to the business or not, but you've got a boatload of money coming in, right? That's going to make private equity investor very happy. Um, and huh. they, were, they were able to save face enough on the truth. And we'll, we'll get to, you know, I, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the SEC filing now, but maybe I'll just jump into that. But the language that was used was very carefully crafted. And we have to believe that the mediator probably had something to do with it, but it says, we acknowledge the court's rulings, finding certain claims about Dominion to be false. We acknowledge the court's rulings. We don't acknowledge the findings, we acknowledge the court's rulings, right? Um, so there's something for everybody there, right? There's something, Fox doesn't have to do its on-air apology. It gets to preserve its relationship with its viewers. And Dominion gets to say, see, the court found it, it wasn't true. So everybody comes away happy. Well, I don't know how happy. Everyone gets to feel, yeah, feel like so a those, win. Those, those are the tells to me that, that this, you know, the major tells that this case was on, should have settled and, and did from a mediator's perspective. The thing that's the outlier about this and was always the, I don't know, the wild card was the whole media spectacle, the political implications, the societal implications, um, the potential for a Supreme Court ruling overturning Sullivan. Uh, you know, all of those things, I don't think anybody could have predicted with certainty that this case would settle. So right. you're talking about other cases, 
you know, as a mediator, we're looking at what's driving the parties, what are their main goals and interests, and then we're also looking at what external factors might be influencing their behaviors. I think that's the, the takeaway for mediators here in terms of how we structure the sessions and, and what we're looking to understand about the parties to see if we can help them get yeah. some. How to, yeah. how to structure that. And I want to talk about that also a little toward the end, because I think there's been some confusion even in the media about the difference between mediation and arbitration and what it is. So I, I think we can kind of end on that note. But Ruth, is there anything else about the you know telltale signs you saw going into this that said this should settle and anything that surprised you about the fact that it did settle or how it settled? Okay. It didn't surprise me at all. I thought it would settle and it had to settle. So there's two things to think about here is, is it always about the money? Now here, it really wasn't only about the money. Fox had plenty of cash assets. So it wasn't a bet the company case, despite the volume that was paid, they still was only 40% of the demand, which is not uncommon. What was uncontrollable here and what they really couldn't predict, although I'm sure they had jury consultants, is what damage could have been done to their brand and their intangible assets, which are their ratings through the very people who are gonna have to testify. The thing that was so difficult for Fox to manage and quite frankly, as an employment lawyer, these were all employees, high ticket employees. And we saw this in the Mueller investigation too. What on earth were these people thinking when they texted their true feelings and thought that it would never come to light? I mean, yeah. we've been through this for so many years. You can all remember the... Um, personification of CEOs by Hollywood, men usually with giant spotlessly clean desks. Why? They didn't want to have their hands on anything. They didn't want to have any, any, any telltale sales. Everything was verbal, thrown away. We learned yeah. with Nixon, don't keep tapes. We've learned that emails are always, emails are always damning. Audios, yeah. we know that people tape people. So the idea that they were going to put their big stars, their Gregory Pecks and Gloria Swanson's uh, in the realm of um, uh, Bartolo Romo and, and Hannity on the stand where they become ordinary mortals, they couldn't afford that. That was incalculable. If people start to flick off Fox, their people, then their business is gone, regardless of how much money they had to spend. Now today, this story is going to eventually is going to fade, and and as what we know about media is that they'll be on to the next. So, with mediation, the mediator is able to say, and I say it all the time, you you have to continue your business if you spend so much time on money on what already happened, you're losing the opportunity to grow and to move ahead, and that. Clearly, we don't know what happened behind the scenes, but the idea that these very powerful, fictitious personalities were going to get chipped away day after day after day, they couldn't risk that. Uh, it reminds me of a story in David Boyes' book, Courting Justice, where he describes deposing Bill Gates in the antitrust litigation. And it's, you know, this battle of smarts where Bill Gates is trying to outsmart him on an email exchange. And did you send this email? No. How did the email get sent? Well, the computer sent it. How does a computer send an email? Well, someone prompts it. Did you prompt it to send it? Yes. You know, and so when you have someone like Bill Gates, who's involved in this litigation and suddenly it's exactly like you say, they're not on the pedestal anymore. How could that affect things? I think it's a great point of what, you know, what has to be a cost that's evaluated. You know, mediation is not just a calculation of what your risk is to lose. $787.5 million is a lot of money. Some of that might be we are concerned we're going to lose and a jury could award that much or more. But some of that might be other factors that have nothing to do with the risks. There's litigation costs. Certainly, that's not a big factor in this big of a settlement. But 
there's the business costs, business disruption, the reputation, all these things drive resolution. And that's another thing that I think lawyers often have a difficult time talking about with their clients because their job is to evaluate the legal risk and their job is to tell the client what the legal risk really is. I find effective mediators are the ones who are able to come in and say, it's not just about what the law says, as unfortunate as that is. And I like to say our legal system, like I think Churchill said, it's the worst system that exists except for all the other ones. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's significant value a mediator can bring. One other thing I'm really curious from both of you, what you think of this, but I always tell parties in mediation, you're not going to get an apology. We, we just don't see it. It doesn't happen. Even in the most confidential jurisdictions like California, where what goes on really stays behind the doors, you just don't get it. People don't make an admission of wrongdoing. It's explicitly in the settlement agreements. This is not an admission of what wrongdoing. What I tell parties is, Money is an apology in this country. Frankly, that's all you're going to get from this jury. So the more money, the more of an apology. And I think what's interesting, what I think is really unique about this corporate filing is beyond what Kyle Bethy referenced before, the language of this reflects Fox's continued commitment to the highest journalistic standards. We're hopeful our decision to resolve this dispute amicably instead of an acrimony of a divisive trial allows the country to move forward from these issues. I think that's as about, about as loud of an apology as I've ever heard to say, we acknowledge at least the court found some statements were false. We acknowledge that we want this to be able to move forward and not have um, you know, the, the acrimony of a trial and maybe who knows what comes from it. And so you know, we, we may not be admitting wrongdoing. We're very careful about how we craft the language, but we're recognizing some of these risks and some of these factors. Do you see that same thing in this specific resolution and anything about that that I've referenced in, in what we do on a daily basis in terms of apologies, parties go in expecting, I want to hear that other side say, I'm sorry, but our role as a mediator to say that may not happen, but here are the ways you can see the telltale signs of an apology. Well, I mean, there's, the, there's a lot has been written about the role of the apology and, you know, since Bill Clinton and the Blue Dress and Harvey Weinstein, the apology has become, if I harmed you, I am sorry. You know, mm -hmm. so this, I think, will go down in the annals of uh, uh, study of the role of the apology. But we do generally discourage the insistence on an apology. And the other thing that we, I hear a lot, I just don't want this to happen to anyone else. So here we're, we have already another plaintiff who's coming up the pike, but also we want to think that Fox will now be more, much more concerned about verifying the truth and reporting the truth, but, but we don't know. And, they, and they, this statement that's in the settlement, we hope that it will have a, a, an interim effect that from a public policy point of view, more media companies will be more concerned about making sure that they're not publishing opinions and just publishing facts. But we don't know. But we can say to clients in mediation that you can't risk, you can't risk a ruling that you're not happy with. You're right. better off settling than getting a ruling that you're not happy with. Yeah, which I which I think is a great point. And I, I think the court's rulings about some of the statements being false doesn't get you to the outcome of there's malice sufficient to you know create a jury verdict, which is why this was going to a jury rather than a summary judgment case. So that's why I think you're right. It's not necessarily acknowledging by even Fox, we were wrong and we would lose. It, it's very possible they would win a trial and Dominion would walk away with nothing. Here they're walking away with close to a billion dollars. Let's add something that, that about the jury. We haven't spoken about the jury. And when you think about the investment that a company makes in its process, in its talent in this particular industry, they know very little about the jurors. They, mm -hmm. they, get, they get like a resume, they do some testing, people act, they, they try to get into the psyche, but you're gonna take this media monolith and put it in the hands of what was it? Twelve. They sat. They sat twelve, and they had twelve alternates. Ordinary yeah. people. We also know, according to media reports, that one juror kind of broke down. 
down and said, I, I can't do it. And a second one was sleeping. Uh, yeah. So, you know, so you're going to put the, you're going to put your company's your future in the in the hands of ordinary mortals who you can't control. You can control your executives. I'm not going to give you a bonus if you don't go along with me. Uh, you'll have to leave if we don't like the way you're reporting the news. But you, those are your jurors. Yeah, juries are, are a coin toss at best. And, you know, I, I remember I was once trying a race case, an African-American who was called or alleged to have been called the N-word many times. And we were picking the jury and I was questioning the, the jurors and my partner was doing research. And there was a person on the stand said, I can be objective, I can be objective. And then my partner found that their Facebook profile, they were a member of KKK and white supremacy groups. And so we struck them for cause, but you really don't know. I mean, you can have as many jury, jury consultants in the audience as possible. You just don't know what a jury might do. And that's the uncertainty of it. Pal Beth, anything else about the apology piece? Do you see this as an apology? Do you see the apology piece play a role in the mediations you do? Yeah, um, first of all, as to whether I see this as an apology, I see enough in there for Dominion to take and mm -hmm. use for its sound bites. But I don't really see it as apology. Um, I see it as a statement for its viewership, mm -hmm. um, a commitment to journalistic standards and to the future of America. And I think that it was carefully crafted with just enough for Dominion, but to the typical average Joe on the street, I don't think they read that as an apology. That's my read on it. But the, the role of the apology generally in, in mediation, I do more B2B mediations. So I, I, don't, I don't see as much as Ruth would with apology, but I do see um, I do see other equitable types of relief being requested. And that's where the mediator has great creativity to nudge one thing along or another. And I also think that the timing is really important for those other intangible non-monetary requests. The timing of this settlement, if they didn't settle now, I don't know that there would have been another opportunity at least maybe right before the verdict came in. And then after that, you know, there was going to be countless appeals, the risk to dem that Dominion is, was ultimately facing was a conservative Supreme Court that very well could tear apart that standard in New York Times versus Sullivan because it was been very criticized from the conservative bench. So the timing, we've talked a lot about the damage to the brand if there wasn't a settlement for Fox, but why was Dominion willing to do this it's, it was sort of now or never. And so that the apology or the value of those, in, those intangible, whatever they are, and the insistence on them may change based on the timing of the mediation itself. A mediation mm -hmm. earlier on may not have gotten the, the sound bite that, that Dominion needed to even consider a settlement. And the timing of this discussion may have force them to accept this reality of whatever this apology, carefully crafted apology look like. I think that's a great point. And I, you know, I don't think any of us have any inside baseball to say this is true, but I would be very shocked if the mediator did not play a really significant role in the crafting of that language, because I do think it very intentionally provides Dominion something of value and Fox some, you know, face saving, if you will, where we're not saying this is an overt apology, but we're also not saying it's not, you know, it's enough here to help kind of bridge that gap. And, and if Dominion's saying we're here for the truth, not for money, if you will, the money here, yes, it makes them whole for any reputational damage, but more than anything, it's it, the money is, is reflecting the risks that existed. And, and the other thing is, it, this case is just another in a long series of cases, right? So we now have the Smartmatic case that's looming out there. So anything that Fox did in this settlement, that's public knowledge, that's publicly being reflected in that statement or media coverage is going to affect the positions in the next litigation. And we don't have a crystal ball on that, but it's unusual in that setting, unless you are mediating 
in a situation where you have multiple litigations going on at the same time, but that's something for the mediator to know, right? right. And often we're not given that information. So we have to go ask for it. Is there anything yeah. else going on that we need to know about? Is there another litigation similar out there? That's a great pivot to what I think is maybe the last topic, but in some ways the main topic I want to discuss. When does mediation come up? When are we called in to step in and play this role? What do we do? What does the process actually look like? And how do we get to the yes at the end of that process? So why don't we start with you, Ruth, on that topic? Okay. Well, that that those questions could could form a 40 <laughs> hour class, but what I would really like to talk about, what I would like to talk about, which we haven't, is selecting the mediator. Mm -hmm. So all we've all we know about Jerry Roscoe as as mediators, we know that he's a you know a top mediator, but these parties had worked with him before. The lawyers had worked with him before. So there was trust. You didn't have to go through the trust building exercise. What I think we have to take away from that is that I have felt for 22 years that I'm doing this, that the parties do not think strategically enough about the mediator. They look for cost and availability. Yeah. They, should, they should put more time into making sure that this is a person that you want to invest your client's goodwill and money in because if the mediation fails it's as Kyle was saying earlier it's hard to know when there will be another opportunity so so the point is that there has to be trust in this person who your both sides are going to so in addition to cost and availability call the mediator call actually talk to the mediator and talk to them a little bit about the case. You don't tell them everything. But make sure that this mediator is going to be simpatico with the clients and that they, their style is the right for the dispute. Professor Sanders at Harvard Workshop on, on negotiation says, fit the form to the fuss. So make mm -hmm. sure you, you have the right person. With the question of timing, when is it right to mediate? I Look, this was a very complex suit. They had to go through discovery to be ready to mediate and be ready to settle. They had to get in front of the jury. I mean, it's, it, there will be movies made of this because it's, it's, it's like a classic Western running up the courthouse steps, 30 lawyers running in. You can't yeah. forget that sometimes cases settle because everyone is just exhausted. We've talked about this enough. We've testified about enough. We've wrote, written enough papers. We've written enough briefs. Enough. Let's, let's get to the resolution without this judge and without this jury. So I think in, in less complex matters, you should try to settle it early before the time and expense and wear and tear mm -hmm. of litigation. But Sometimes it takes a few depositions. Sometimes it takes a lost motion or I'm sometimes shocked that both sides have fully briefed and they want, they want to mediate before the decision comes down. They're worried sometimes. I, you know, that, that's a piece of it. We talked about it before briefly, but I've seen cases settle right before the jury verdict because we've watched how it's played out and one side has more of a concern they're going to lose than the other side or, you know. They just get a sick feeling. We better take care yeah. of this. The gut feeling, and that's when we get brought in at the eleventh hour. <laughs> but it's not scientific. It's not. It's not scientific. That's what I felt, found that was so interesting about all this. You, you, you couldn't really. Uh, maybe somebody on the Fox side has done an actual damage calculation, but you really can't know what Ruth. What's the case worth? What do you think the case is worth? What should I ask? It, it, it's you're in you're in the market it's a holistic and, it's a gestalt type of a thing it's it's everything at play and i think and i think I, that was one of the and i think here that truly was one of the um impetus to settle is that dominion was concerned how do we improve damages i mean how many there haven't been too many presidential elections where the, yeah. vote, the voting machines have been <laughs> uh, cast out on how do you how do you and I think they were worried about that. 
Kyle Beth, any, any thoughts on that generally? I'd like to go back to when mediate, why mediate a, a little bit and, and the getting to yes, a few thoughts on that. Um, I have, as an arbitrator, I've had many cases in front of me that in my head, I'm thinking, why aren't these people mediating this? What's mm-hmm. the whole, right? Now, I, as the arbitrator, I, I keep my mouth shut, right? That's not my responsibility or even appropriate for me to make that suggestion. There is a trend though, and we see this as, as arbitrators with the American Arbitration Association toward a, a dual track mediation arbitration where the case is going down two paths at the exact same time. Um, and a mediator is appointed and an arbitrator is appointed. Now the arbitrator is like your judge, like your jury, right? Just moving along through some form of discovery. And usually it's much more abbreviated in arbitration, um, but through the process to get to a a ruling, right? That's what an arbitrator does. And And the arbitrator is not aware of what the mediation is doing. And the mediator is not aware of what the arbitration is doing. So the mediator is going on a separate track when would the mediator decide to, this is the time to hold the sessions. Maybe they have multiple rounds, maybe some before an initial try before discovery, then maybe in the midst or after, but they're going on parallel tracks. And I can tell you that many of the cases that are on those dual tracks do do end up settling. I mean, it's a settlement country, right? You know, most things do settle before they get to all the way. But to your broader question of why mediate, when mediate, how mediate, and your ultimate was getting to yes, not every mediation is meant to settle. And that's okay. I mean, I I don't go into mediation with the goal of reaching a settlement. I go into a mediation with the goal of getting parties to understand what their options are and make the best decision for them. If that happens to be a settlement, that's great. But it's not my job to push that on them. And I'm not trying to just rack up notches in my belt of, you know, hey, I got a settlement today. I got, I mean, it's great if that happens because the parties wanted it. Right. That's, it's their process. So um, not all cases should settle, but there are ones that I've had in front of me as an arbitrator. And I was like, why isn't this settling? It's crying <laughs> out for settlement. They're, they, this is so, would be so easy to craft. What I tell parties all the time is I don't like when mediators say a good settlement is when both parties leave a little unhappy or something like that. The way I perceive it is you're going to walk away feeling very happy that you made the most educated decision for yourself in this case. And that might be paying out money that you didn't want to, but it's still the most educated decision. And you're smart, you're capable of making that educated decision. My role as a mediator is to make sure you're fully educated. It's to make sure every stone has been turned. A good mediator has a significant role and it's not to tell the parties what to do, it's to help the parties realize, to get to the underlying issues and the core issues and realize the value in resolution that they might not otherwise get to on their own. It's a holistic process between everyone. So I think that's a huge value. That's what I see as, Maybe the the best thing I'd like to see come from this publicity of this settlement is, you know, and and not to say that we're selling ourselves as mediators, you should come book us for, you know, uh, mediations, but to say people should embrace the process of mediation. I'm going to give both of you a a minute to kind of summarize if there's anything else you wanted to say, and then I don't want to keep you because you've both given us so much of your time. Kyle, Beth, any last minute thoughts? I I think the, the, every mediator probably reading this feels good feels validated feels validated because we get up and we we take on these cases that seem impossible and we stick with them and we we stick with them we don't feel we don't feel defeated when they don't settle but we when they do it it sure does feel good and to every litigator out there who said i can do this myself i don't need a mediator this is a perfect example of where a mediator really came in and save the day. So yep. I'll be a little good. <laughs> about- uh, yeah. I mean, look, sometimes the lawyers can do it, but um, don't be shy to, to engage a mediator. Ruth, any last minute thoughts from you? Yeah. I, I think I agree with Kyle Beth that 
we, we can all take a certain satisfaction in Jerry Roscoe's role here. And we can take away some lessons and help to educate the public on. And I look forward to, I'm sure he will be a keynote speaker in the <laughs> days ahead the way everybody wanted to hear what Ken Feinberg had to say. I'm sure we'll want to hear his dance car will be full, but I think the fact that they were, that even as the judge said, the lawyering on both sides was so keen that they probably knew just who to call, when to call right. and, and the timing all worked, worked out well, whether we're happy or not happy with it, it's not up to us. And we can't look to a, private what's really a, a, a case between two private companies of the public that's not where pu public policy is made you have to leave that for the ballot box but thank you Ed, yeah. for moderating and showing us your skills as a mediator i appreciate it no thank you both you're you're both very experienced and i'll, I'll make sure to leave a link to both of your websites kyle beth and ruth so that people listeners that want to you know look into both of you and and be thoughtful about the differences that you each have in selecting. I appreciate both of you taking the time and having this discussion on a really hot topic. Without an audience, we would be nothing. So I'd like to thank you, the listener, for tuning in to another episode of Mediator in the Middle. Please take the time to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, Spotify, Apple, whatever it might be. And please feel free to refer a friend. Until next time, we look forward to seeing you and keep calm and mediate on. Thank you.